All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming to our second Saturday uh, this month. Uh, today's lecture is entitled um, New Mexico's Indigenous Languages, Critical Challenges and Possibilities. Uh, today's lecture is all about the leading efforts for indigenous language revitalization within the state of New Mexico. Dr. Christine Sims uh, is an associate professor at UNM and director for the American Indian Language Policy Research and Teaching Trainer Training Center. Uh, she specializes in indigenous language revitalization and maintenance issues providing technical assi assistance to indigenous nations and language program planning and training American Indian language teachers. Dr. Sims has served as member of the New Mexico Bilingual Advisory Committee for the Public Education Department's Bilingual Multicultural Education Bureau. She was elected by the National Association for the Bilingual Education uh, as the 2002 recipient of the Raymond L. Santiago President's Award for research and advocacy on language rights issues for Native American communities. In 2013, she received the Senator Joseph M. Montoya Award from the New Mexico Association for Bilingual Education for state and national contributions to native language issues. So today, uh, Dr. Sims invites us to take a retrospective look at the language initiatives in Acoma, as well as the overall language efforts in New Mexico. Uh, so if you would please hold your questions to the end, we will have a Q&A with Dr. Sims and I will let you take it away. All right, let's hope this works. <laughs> okay, so I am trying to release this pause. Can you see me advancing the slides, Aaron? I cannot, no. No? Okay. Uh, hold on here. There we go, we can see that. All right. How's that? Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. No problem. So thank you everybody for taking time out to um, come and attend this lecture. I, I was uh, telling Aaron earlier, it would have been nice to have this in real person out at San Isidro um, in, uh, I believe it's in Corrales, right? That the, Correct. In, yeah, the San Isidro says, I've, I've never gone into that building, but I, I would have loved to be there. But be that as it may, I, I thank you all for, for coming to this event. What I wanted to share with you today was um, just a, a quick maybe history and, and, and also uh, some information about contemporary issues with regard to uh, New Mexico's indigenous languages. And I entitled my lecture today as Critical Challenges and Possibilities because uh, many of the things that um, I have seen over 50 years of work in Native American bilingual education, as well as currently um, the work that I do to support um, language revitalization efforts among our tribal communities, uh, it has been an interesting journey and, uh, and it's still an ongoing journey. Uh, but I think, like I said, with, it was some 50 years of retrospect, um, working in this field, you know, there's been some important things that I have seen as challenges, but also things that have um, created the, the groundwork, if you will, for, for possibilities, good possibilities with regard to languages in our state. Um, I am from Acoma Pueblo. And 
Uh, I do uh, teach at the University of New Mexico and uh, I'm an associate professor there. I joined UNM in 1999. Uh, so I, I've been there uh, for quite some time now. But prior to my coming to the University of New Mexico, um, my work in American Indian bilingual education was something that I, uh, I did for a good maybe at least 15, 20 years before that time, uh, going back to the early 1970s. So um, that's why this white hair is here, <laughs> uh, just in terms of the length of time that I've, I've been in this field. Um, <clears throat> A lot of the work that I did initially as part of um, my, uh, uh, my uh, I guess you could say my field work, the things that prepared me uh, before coming to UNM were things that were um, tied primarily to bilingual education. And I was, uh, I noted with uh, Aaron uh, that, that the work that, um, that uh, I, did before that time, it was primarily in this area of bilingual education. Uh, let's see if I can advance this. It's okay, oops. Okay. Um, when Dr. Uh, Ward Allen Minch wrote his book about ACOMA, um, which was, I think, originally the 76 publication, uh, there was a, a bilingual education. Um, effort um, primarily in the community school that uh, uh, at the time was called Sky City Community School is now called Hago Academy. And it's gone from a uh, BIE, Bureau of Indian Education School to now a tribal control school. Uh, and that recent development has, has been only within the last, I would say five, five six years or so. But at the time when, um, uh, Dr. Minch wrote his book. Uh, we were just kind of at the forefront of beginning um, to really see bilingual education take off in school. Uh, and it um, was something that I became involved in. I actually helped direct that program for a time in the 1980s. Um, and uh, since that time, uh, I've uh, worked in other capacities, not only um, in my own community, but also eventually I went on to work as the New Mexico Regional Director for a um, bilingual center that was actually based out of Arizona State University. Um, and then after I, I finished uh, that stint as a, as a Regional Director, um, I went ahead and um, formed my own I helped co-found a nonprofit organization called the Linguistic Institute for Native Americans. Um, this was a, 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 I guess you could say a grassroots effort among Native American um, bilingual educators. Many of my colleagues, uh, some from Acoma, some from Navajo community. Um, these were folks that had a common interest in helping to build on bilingual education at that time. And so we were pretty much in the forefront of um, creating training programs for Native American bilingual teachers. And this was in the late 70s, early 80s that we were doing this work. Um, the the uh, Linguistic Institute for Native Americans um, basically ran these programs from the 1980s to the early 1990s. Um, after um, about the mid 1990s, there thereafter, um, I started working on my own doctorate program at UC Berkeley in California, and I was able to learn more about these issues of language revitalization, language shift. Those are things that I will talk about this afternoon. What that meant for Native uh, language communities. I myself hadn't seen that in my own um, community, uh, at least not at that time. And my introduction to these issues in the, the mid 1990s was um, purely by my being able to um, do my research and visit communities, language communities in Northern California uh, my professors at Berkeley um, strongly suggested that I, I go and visit these communities so that I had a better 
grasp about what, what some communities were grappling with with regard to loss of language, native language, in their efforts to try and uh, revitalize these languages. So that was really my first kind of introduction to these issues because I, uh, in my community and in many other Pueblo communities, there was still uh, a good number of um, people speaking these languages in the adult generations. Uh, even in the 1970s, we were still seeing children coming into school uh, who still understood and, and could speak these languages. That was in the 1970s. And so language loss and language shift was something I, I was not familiar with. So, um, you know, uh, fast forward then, you know, later on in, in when I joined uh, the University of New Mexico, I brought that experience in, in also my prior work with bilingual education uh, to UNM. And from there, I was able to change my focus, if you will, more towards language revitalization because there were many things happening by the 1990s that shifted this focus from uh, bilingual to now having to uh, regenerate native languages, especially among young school age children. So these are the languages primarily among Pueblo languages that we have in New Mexico. Um, I will be speaking more from, from this uh, perspective because that's what I know best. Um, we do have in New Mexico, the Athabascan language family that's represented by the uh, Hickoria and Muscalero Apache nations, as well as the Diné nation. Um, but among the Pueblos, the 19 Pueblos here in New Mexico, these are the major language families that are spoken among these Pueblos. And if you, you look at this particular slide on, um, under the label Keras, um, those uh, seven Pueblos that are listed there uh, have different dialects of this language. And some dialects are mutually intelligible. For example, Acoma and Laguna, uh, we can understand each other very well. Uh, but the, the distance between um, Acoma and say Cochiti uh, is a dialect that sometimes it, uh, it gets a little bit harder to understand because of maybe differences in word usage and that sort of thing. But what's important about these different dialects is that they are also a, um, I guess you could say an identifier from where you are from. Uh, and among the Kara speakers, you can pretty well tell where somebody is from, which Pueblo they're from, just by listening to their dialect of Keras. So those are, those are important identifier markers for our communities. You'll see Zuni by itself because that's the only Pueblo that speaks that language. Um, Tiwa um, has four different, uh, I call them dialects. Um, there's a, um, some linguists have distinguished these as Northern Tiwa, Southern Tiwa, meaning Taos and Picaris to the North and uh, folks in, in the Southern part of the state, Sandia and Isleta. Um, but it's not, it's not so much that Taos and Picaris are, are closer, although, uh, you know, I've asked Taos people, can you understand people from Picaris? And they say it's, it's really hard for us to understand Picaris. Uh, on the other hand, Picaris say, well, it's easy to understand the Taos people. So there's all kinds of variation in terms of dialect, but definitely there's a really big difference and gap. Um, the, the mutual intelligibility gets wider between those Pueblos and the ones down south, Sandia and Isleta. Towa is only spoken by Hamas, the Hamas um, Pueblo people. Tewa has six different dialects and you see them listed here. San Juan or Okeowinge is now, they use that now, which is their own name for themselves. Um, Santa Clara, San Ildefonso, Tsuki, Nambe, and Powaki. Those are the Tewa speakers. What's unique about these particular languages is they're not spoken anywhere else in the world. They're not spoken anywhere else in the United States. And all the linguists will tell you that Tiwa, Tewa, and Towa belong to a larger phylum of, of languages. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that these folks can understand each other, you know, by language families. 
Um, so I really call these distinct language families because they are only spoken in these particular pueblos. Um, Tiwa, Towa, Tewa, Zuni speakers couldn't understand Keras, nor could Keras speakers understand these other languages. They're as different as they are as Russian is from Chinese or English. I mean, they're, they're, there's no kind of um, uh, common root between these particular uh, language uh, families. Uh, within dialects, there, there is that um, uh, mutual intelligibility, but again, that varies uh, among pueblos. The other unique thing about these languages is that these were already here at the time of first contact when Spanish entered into the Southwest in the 1500s. And we know that because of the way that the Spanish um, uh, documented, you know, throughout their exploration, the names of these places and uh, the villages that these languages were spoken uh, were already here. They had been here for centuries. Uh, and so you have to appreciate that these languages have been around for a long time. And that the only way that these languages persisted is by oral transmission, meaning that there was no written language, there was no writing systems uh, uh, developed. These primarily lasted because they were transmitted orally generation after generation. The other unique feature about these particular languages is of course, uh, with first contact in, with Spanish in the 1500s, uh, we, we do see a, um, a, how would I say, a number of lexical categories that um, come from Spanish uh, and they are mostly limited to names of material, Spanish material culture. By that, I mean things like names of domesticated animals, domesticated uh, uh, fruits, trees, plants, um, things that the Spanish brought that were not here before. Um, so in, in most all of these pueblos, you will see some uh, reflection of that. But again, what I tell people is it was limited primarily to names of vocabulary, names of material culture. What the Spanish language did not do was it did not take over the Pueblo languages. It did not influence the internal structures of how these languages work. Those continued to be maintained as they were. In, in essence, what Pueblo people did was they basically picked and choose uh, what what things that they had they didn't know and had a name for and, and in various ways um, they imported that if you will into their own lexicon so you will see some similarities in, among some of these pueblos about how certain Spanish loan words are pronounced you know I'll take a, for example a word like um, uh, caballo in Spanish you know in 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 Acumacaris, that it would be pronounced as kawaii. Listen to the difference again between Spanish, kawaii, akamakaris, kawaii. And you'll see these variations in different languages across these pueblos, um, uh, even Zuni, which is by itself, that it has no other speakers. Uh, there's interestingly some things that um, have uh, a commonality in terms of these Spanish loan words. Lastly, the thing I would say is that these languages have primarily existed for purposes of their own um, social cultural uses in each of these pueblos. They've not been used for scientific purposes or educational, formal education purposes, at least not until fairly recently in some languages. These languages have primarily persisted because of their use for um, for maintaining our own social cultural relationships and networks and uh, that we have in our in our pueblos they've existed for socio religious purposes um, they've existed primarily for the things that we do as as pueblo people uh, and it has not been the case as we see in other larger rural languages where even for, even for example, in Navajo, uh, 
Um, that language um, has been used in many other domains other than just the social cultural domain of language use. You can see their language now being used in the legal court system, uh, in, in the health, uh, public health systems. You even now see translations of um, uh, Walt Disney movies like uh, the cartoon things that children watch movie wise. Uh, Star well, Walt Disney isn't Star Wars, but you see all those kinds of uses of, of, of Navajo, much more public use of that language. These languages by contrast have not been used for those particular purposes. <clears throat> I want to just briefly mention that at least probably up to the 1950s, there was still very much present, not only in New Mexico, but in nationally, um, this federal, US federal education policy, which prohibited the use of native languages. And this was a far cry from, um, uh, from where we are today, definitely. Um, but certainly um, we saw this prohibition, especially among um, uh, boarding school environments. Uh, I one time um, interviewed a Pueblo man who recalled his experience in a, a uh, federal government day school in the early 1950s. And this is what he says. He says, everyone knew what the marked off squares on the classroom floor meant because these were the places where empty gunny sacks lay, one in each square alongside one wall of the classroom. This was where the teacher put you if she caught you speaking Karis. The punishment was be made to step into the gunny sack with teacher tying up the top so you couldn't get out. There you sat for hours tied up in a gunny sack until teacher determined that you had learned your lesson do not speak Keras, only English. So this kind of policy was present in especially US uh, federal government funded schools for decades, uh, even lasting into the 1950s. Um, I have many contemporary childhood friends and relatives who, who can still remember uh, being punished for speaking their language. And, Certainly our, my, our, my own parents and my grandparent generations, those would have been the generations that um, endured these kinds of policies uh, of not being able to use their native languages because English was part of that assimilationist agenda that the federal government was imposing uh, in their schools. And the thought was that by prohibiting native language use, uh, they, in fact, would um, turn children away from their own language, their own culture, and uh, instead adopt English, uh, adopt American societal ways. Um, and of course, we know in retrospect that uh, in some ways, much of those kinds of policies failed. Uh, and in fact, it, it really uh, created uh, this historical gap in terms of uh, education and who who controlled education for, for long periods of time uh, up to contemporary uh, times in the 70s and 80s. But this prohibition of native language was very different than what we were entering into by the late 1970s. Because by the 1970s, um, because of all the social upheaval that was going on nationally in the 60s. Uh, if you grew up in the 60s, you remember, you know, all of those social kinds of um, demonstrations of equity and, and uh, social uh, kinds of inequities that were um, part of those demonstrations and protests that went on in the 60s. Uh, well, it eventually generated then uh, what we knew at that time as um, federal bilingual funding to help ensure that children could access um, the educational programs of their school and that they could use their own languages, their home languages in order to do this. So that those kind of sweeping new laws of the 70s uh, opened up bilingual education uh, across the country for a lot of communities and schools uh, 
uh, where children who came from different language backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, could have the, the service of bilingual programs helping them. And the intent of those programs was really to make, help children make that transition to English in schools while also maintaining their heritage language. Uh, and so we saw that coming into New Mexico uh, in the late 70s, early 70s, throughout uh, into the late 1980s. Um, there's bilingual programs in many of our pueblos, including Acoma, uh, San Juan, uh, Santa Clara, Zuni, for example. Um, their programs um, got off the ground because at, at that time, um, the federal government made it possible for these federal funds to flow directly to tribes. And that's where I came in on the picture around 19, early 1980s, somewhere in there, um, because ACMA, for example, my own community, did have a uh, bilingual program. Um, and while the funds flowed through the tribe, the services were provided to uh, Sky City Community School, which was a BIE. BIA uh, government um, day school. And during this time, uh, of course, like I said, we were still seeing children who spoke their native languages. Um, and so the thought was, well, let's make sure that we can help them access the, the English curriculum. And so uh, it, it brought about a lot of, of change, but primarily, the things that I, I recall during that period is that the funding that came with these federal funds provided the means for which some of our first uh, native Pueblo teachers became bilingual teachers and that they became regular certified teachers who could um, you know, re, uh, provide the um, instructional services that were needed uh, in their communities. And some of those first bilingual uh, teachers, certified teachers, you know, are, are uh, now, of course, retired. Uh, and in many cases, some of them are, are still uh, involved in some way uh, with uh, language education um, efforts in their communities. But um, some of these uh, um, folks, when they were young and um, just starting out, uh, they, were the, they were the folks who, uh, sometimes then um, joined bilingual programs and they were the folks that um, went on to acquire in some cases um, some linguistic skills that enabled them to um, begin to um, write their own languages. As you remember, I said none of these languages had ever been written. In some pueblos, not all, um, there was a, a beginning um, move to start to develop orthographies, writing systems for these languages um, back in the 1970s. In Acoma, for example, um, there had been uh, uh, linguistic uh, studies done by a um, linguist by the name of Wick Miller. He had done his initial uh, linguistic work on Acoma grammar as part of his um, doctoral studies. Uh, and uh, although he had done quite a bit on uh, detailed linguistic um, descriptions of the language, none of that information, which was very technical, had, had been transferred or transformed into uh, things that Acoma could use as in terms of actually developing a writing system. Um, but certainly his work was one of the things that was the basis for a number of, um, a handful of people in Acoma Pueblo who began to work on developing a writing system. I myself had never been exposed to this either because I, my undergraduate work in, uh, you know, in education, I, I had never taken any linguistics courses. I, I didn't have, an idea of, to be frank with you, I, I had no idea that I could write my language because I had never seen it in a written form. You know, all my lifetime was just hearing it, right? And, he, and, and observing people speaking it. But to actually capture sound into written form, I had never seen that done with my language. And so um, I, I attended several summer linguistic institutes that had been put on by the folks out of Dallas, Texas called the 
Summer Institute of Linguistics. And that was the first time that I, I and several other Acoma people and other Pueblo uh, speakers of their languages uh, were introduced to these linguistic tools. And, and that was where I learned how to develop a writing system with uh, guidance from a field linguist who worked with us. And um, in later years, we kind of fine tuned that writing system to, to uh, what it is now today. Um, but the reason for doing that primarily was to start developing instructional materials in a written language for children, um, our own children. And those materials uh, were primarily things that um, would reflect Akama, you know, stories, Akama culture, uh, that sort of thing. And they, uh, they were to be used primarily within the schools where these bilingual programs um, were, were um, servicing. So in our case at Akama, for example, there, there are now uh, still a handful of people, you know, who learned how to use that writing system. Um, but it was not a community-wide literacy effort. Uh, it was just targeted for the school. And in the tribe, our tribe, Pueblo of Acoma, at that time sanctioned that work that was done there. And some of the materials that were first um, produced were handwritten materials because we had no such thing as typewriters who could uh, that could uh, type in the special uh, uh, symbols that we, we needed to be able to write uh, Akama. And so many of those first materials were literally handwritten and, and you know, they were um, pr uh, produced in uh, a good number so that they could be used in the school. Later on, as things got more um, technical, uh, technology uh, oriented, um, we, uh, this is the time in the eighties when I had, was in this program, the bilingual program at home, uh, we started to see uh, selectric typewriters with specialized font balls that you could interchange. And the font balls were, had the, the letters that you needed for your language. Um, that seemed to be such a big breakthrough, you know, at the time, of course, now that all doesn't matter because we're now in a, in a digital age where you can, you know, use anything to, to produce different uh, language types, you know, different font things. But at that time, that was where we were in terms of producing materials. The other highlight of that era sorry, had to do with pre preparing language teachers um, who basically didn't have the support that they needed to be able to work in bilingual programs. Um, and I was part of that. And um, excuse me for just a second, I, want, I need to put the dog outside. Sorry for that. <laughs> The, the training of teachers was also another uh, event that came about because there was no training programs for native bilingual teachers in the state. The State Department of Education didn't have training programs. And so the grassroots efforts to create uh, training was something that we uh, I was involved in along with a number of folks uh, in bilingual education. Overall, this whole period of bilingual education was a time that it really raised that consciousness about native language use, that it was okay to speak your language in school. Fast forward to the 1990s, there was a dramatic shift that we were beginning to observe in that children were no longer coming or entering school for the first time with their native languages. Um, and it was something so apparent that we knew that it wasn't a matter of just continuing with bilingual kinds of approaches where you use two languages, you know, at the same time, because now most children were coming to school with English and primarily English as their spoken first language. And that was very different from a time when children were coming with the native language. And so we really had to rethink 
what our approaches, uh, what, what, uh, how we needed to change also our pro approaches for not only preparing teachers, but also to work with communities so that they could better understand uh, this process that was unfolding in many communities, not just in New Mexico, but also nationally. I'm gonna put on my earphones here so I can. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, thank you. So the shift in, in, in um, language, which, which is often referred to as language shift, really prompted a different look at what needed to be done to support and maintain these languages. And language immersion was an approach that um, I had seen uh, and I had observed in my uh, doctoral studies uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, these were initiatives that were also being um, uh, developed and implemented in different parts of the country. Um, places like Hawaii, for example, began their first uh, immersion schools in the 1980s. And these kinds of approaches were different in that it had a real focus on uh, providing an environment in which the children will hear exclusively the target language being spoken. And so in our community in Acoma, uh, some of our first immersion initiatives happened in uh, the mid 1990s. Uh, we were able to fund these initiatives through uh, initial funding from uh, ANA, the Administration for Native Americans, which had a competitive grant process and we were able successfully to get several years of funding to plan a program to do our own internal community survey about um, language um, uh, language lost, but also what our own community members thought about uh, efforts to re-strengthen language. And some of these pilot programs would happen during the summer where we would um, begin to work with a small number of children and basically train our own people as to how those programs could go in a full immersion approach. We had never done that before in our communities. And so uh, the 1990s was some of the first summer immersion programs that happened. Cochiti Pueblo was another Pueblo that at the same time uh, was embarking on these same efforts. And initially in the 1990s, we did a lot of cross sharing between the two communities um, because we were doing the same similar kinds of things in our in our uh, communities. And the feed, main feature of these initiatives initiatives is the fact that they weren't happening in school settings. This These were community-based efforts. So a lot of times they happened outdoors, you know, uh, they happened in the in the villages at Cochiti, for example. They did a lot of their activities in the plaza, but um, all of the resources that were needed to put these pilot programs on were primarily the community, meaning the speakers of these languages. So we had aunties, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, you know, people who volunteered to step forward um, in, in some of those initiatives uh, really began to, to take off. Um, and I know in Cochiti Pueblo, they even eventually started what they call a language nest, which is a child care center um, for um, infants all the way up to, I believe, four-year-olds. Um, but this was um, planned as, as a way in which young children young babies could still be immersed in the Coach de Caris language. Um, that language nest is modeled after the language nest that the Maori people in New Zealand first developed. And then Hawaii also took that as another um, initiative that they developed for their children. And so Cochiti um, was one of the only, in fact, they're still the only Pueblo that has this kind of a immersion, what they call language nest for, for young children. About 2000, somewhere in there, um, we, we meaning uh, those of us at ACOMA that had been working on language immersion um, initiatives, uh, began to really seriously think about what it would take to support children year round, not just in summer programs, but year round in terms of native language development. 
So by the early 2000s, somewhere in there, um, thereafter, um, uh, Acoma and even Cochiti, I believe was another Pueblo that did this. They started working with their local school district to see if we could establish language immersion classes in, in these schools where children could continue to, to build on their language learning while they were in school. And um, that was something that we had not tried before. Um, and it certainly was a real learning curve for school administrators at that time because they had never had an immersion class for a native language in their schools. Um, and um, uh, coupled with that was the was the idea that they had not um, they had not um, had a a tribal um, controlled, if you will, effort to make these kinds of language classes happen. Because uh, primarily, you know, by, with bilingual education, a lot of that was often directed, um, you know, by the schools. But this was a very different approach in that the tribes were the ones um, who wanted to make sure uh, that these kinds of classes, one, were in sync with what was happening with community efforts. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the um, teachers who were in these schools um, were people that um, the community recognized as um, speakers of the language. So all of these issues kind of came to a head uh, after 2000, because it, at one point, um, the uh, public education department um, was very much under the gun with uh, a federal education policy called the No Child Left Behind Act, if you remember that. That was introduced around uh, 2002. Um, that probably had one of the biggest impacts in terms of um, its influence on what schools could do or couldn't do because it was a high stakes era of, of um, meeting standardized test scores and all public schools were under the gun for meeting those standards. But in effect, its impact was also felt heavily on native language um, programs in schools because NCLB, No Child Left Behind, also required schools to have fully staffed what they call certified um, teachers. And because many language teachers at that time didn't have formal college credentials to be teaching their language classes in schools, they were often the first ones targeted um, in terms of eliminating their positions in schools, primarily because of that federal act. We saw this happening in places like Arizona, uh, where um, language teachers no longer had jobs, uh, the language classes were not allowed anymore. All of these was were, the, I guess you could say, the after effects of No Child Left Behind. And much of what uh, happened in that era basically um, uh, took away much of the impetus for language programs in, in schools. So there needed to be new policies, new ways of working around this. And so in New Mexico, um, the Indian Education Act was passed in 2002, uh, which, um, uh, which asked, or not asked, but uh, required that uh, native language um, support be provided in New Mexico schools. Around 2002, uh, there was a collective effort among many of the tribes in New Mexico to see the establishment of a uh, alternative certificate for native speakers, which would allow them to teach in New Mexico public schools. All of this came about right about 2002 in there. And basically those things are still in place today. And we use those as a way to advocate for continued improvement on some of these programs, but also to make sure that those policies stay intact, because that was a time when tribal governments came to the table with public education department folks and sat down and agreed on some of those policies which are in place today. Um, the other thing that has prompted um, uh, I guess you could say my continued work in this area has been um, the establishment of a language center, which I, I 
created in 2008 at UNM in the College of Education. It's called the American Indian Language Policy Research and Teacher Training Center. Uh, and with the help of my um, department chair, Dr. Rebecca Blue Martinez, uh, we were successful in making this one of the federal priorities for UNM. And we subsequently were able to secure some seed funding from the US Department of Education to establish this center. And what we do as a center is then to advocate on behalf of native language issues. Um, we work with tribes when we are asked for our assistance. Uh, for technical kinds of issues, program planning, and um, also then teacher training. Every summer we provide a Native American Language Teachers Institute. We've not done that um, last year because of COVID. Uh, this year we're gonna try to bring it back again, but all virtually. But uh, again, we're the only uh, IHG Institute of Higher Education in New Mexico that provides this kind of service. Um, and we do this not only summers, but also year, year round with training workshops um, whenever we're uh, requested um, for our services. Continuing challenges. Here are some couple of things that I, I have continually thought about, worked towards, and, and we're still not always, you know, through the, um, uh, through these challenges, but they are certainly things that um, uh, I, I feel are important if these efforts to sustain language and also to sustain programmatic efforts, um, there's some very basic things that we still continue to make sure are done. It, one of the bigger questions now that some of these efforts have gone into school settings is then how do we continue to support a children's language instruction throughout their educational years? Most bilingual programs, state bilingual funded programs, um, usually start tapering off even by, you know, middle elementary grades and then it's, it's really rare that you sometimes see these into middle school and high school. For our kind of language programs that we need for children to learn and sustain their native languages, we need that continuous support throughout their, their, um, uh, throughout their education years. Uh, and what it requires then is that schools be able to come forward and collaborate with tribes on an equal basis to make sure that those programs uh, retain their integrity in terms of what the community desires, in terms of what these children are expected to learn in the native language, uh, but also <clears throat> have uh, have a a um, say about um, not only who teaches these languages, but also um, how, for example. Um, Language teachers will be supported through professional development, you know, um, how uh, children uh, can be supported in language development outside the classroom setting. It's all these things that go into um, programmatic kinds of issues that oftentimes end up being institutional barriers. So that's always a constant challenge when we bring these kinds of efforts into school settings. Um, another challenge that I know that is is really there for all of us in our respective communities is that uh, the capacity building so that we're able to do more after school programs, for example, or summer programs. Oftentimes in many of our Pueblos tribal li libraries have kind of become the hub for providing all kinds of um, uh, extra services in terms of education. Uh, sometimes libraries are the only places where children can access in the internet, for example. Um, and so there's been a recent effort within the last two years to make sure um, that we that public education funding be fun uh, to help support these kinds of efforts through tribal libraries. Um, and that's been on the legislative agenda for, for a couple of years, especially in light of the recent um, Yazi Martinez case that you might have heard of in the, in the news. Thirdly, building the capacity of language communities to develop their own materials and instructional resources is, is sorely needed. Whether you're teaching in an oral-based approach, meaning that the language still is not written, but you are still teaching orally, 
or in the case of some programs that have uh, the tribes have sanctioned a written language and they're, they're using that for purposes of teaching language, those resources that are needed for instruction are not there in, in big publisher, book publishers uh, do not, of course, will not invest in these kinds of localized efforts. So basically, local communities, language teachers are the primary sources for developing materials like that. Fourth, in some communities, we know that fluent adult speakers who are mostly elderly cannot always be there to teach, uh, to help teach. So there is this need now to really grow new language teachers, meaning younger ones in our communities. And for that, we need continued professional development for them. Um, those kinds of efforts, again, are still primarily uh, offered through our center at UNM, but we need much more funding to be able to expand that so that we can grow new language teachers in our communities. And then lastly, there is a acknowledgement and recognition now, I think in more communities that even young parent adult generations um, struggle to um, learn the language because they, they didn't learn it as well, perhaps as previous generations did. And so they struggle as to how to support their children as they return from you know, language classes in schools. And now at home, perhaps it's become a challenge to, as to how to support that. I've heard some parents say that they're learning things from their children that they didn't know themselves. So there's that interest oftentimes, but how to do that and how to mentor adult learners is just as critical a challenge and a need in many of our communities. This continuous education of younger adult uh, parent generations, especially is important because oftentimes there's this messaging that schools especially convey and in, in, in the bigger society about how uh, English is, is the term determiner of success, educational success. Well, I believe that part of what we need to actually message to our children is that you can have two languages or more at the same time, because this is really actually the norm in most all of the world where children learn multiple languages, even by the, by the age of five. In this country, it's been a history of only that kind of um, one focus on English, one language. And, and, and now really we are in a time when even the educational research has shown that it's not to the detriment of children to be able to learn more than one language. And this is what we want parents to understand so that they can also um, uh, get behind many of these efforts to teach children native languages. Some promising developments very quickly, I just wanna just highlight too, because they really are a very different way of, of doing school, if you will. Um, at Walatoa um, Head Start um, in Jemez Pueblo, in 2015, they started this journey of transition in their Head Start program to what is now a full TOA immersion Head Start program. There's no English being used in this program right now. The kids already come to school knowing English, okay? It's that, it's that issue of making sure that they maintain TOA and that they have that support in using that language when they're very young, because that is the optimal age in which you want children to pick these languages up because it comes so easily. So they began that effort in 2015. It's still a very strong effort. Um, our center has been part of the training support for the staff as they made this uh, uh, conscious choice um, and also uh, a choice by their leadership, that this tribal leadership, that this would take place. Um, so they've been uh, really uh, doing a fantastic job in implementing this change. The second um, example, again, comes from a very grassroots effort um, by a member of Cochiti, um, Santa Domingo Pueblo, um, uh, Ms. Trisha Mokino, uh, established the Caris Children's Learning Center in Cochiti Pueblo in 2012. Uh, she was, she's an uh, alumni of our College of Ed at UNM. Uh, got her master's there, but she went on to get training in the Montessori approach, and, and uh, she has taken that uh, uh, um, training in order to establish what she uh, sees as a way in which to ground children in 
acculturative language and culture, uh, and as they begin to also introduce uh, English at uh, later grades, they do have that ground in, in, in the Keras language that, uh, again, I've, I've seen in terms of children being able to use that language for communicative purposes that are uh, uh, have really um, been the result of efforts of their community. And certainly Ms. Mokina has, has been the, at the forefront of making sure that that school uh, maintains this focus. And so these are examples of um, things that we hope to see would develop um, in many more communities. And we also see now a growing shift towards looking at early childhood education more with the development of the um, new uh, state early childhood education department. Uh, we see this as an opportunity to also help our own communities develop the kinds of it programs that re-envision how we do early child education with a focus on language and culture. So our center is uh, has begun to offer the series of free um, Zoom sessions. Um, and our session coming up uh, in next week, we'll talk about uh, KCLC, the Karis Children's Learning Center, and Ms. Bokina will be highlighting their journey uh, towards establishing this school. So um, that's pretty much uh, it for, for kind of this quick run through on, on a history, if you will, of, of where languages, especially in our Pueblos have come and um, where we are at today. But uh, I, I wanna thank you for um, your attention and I'll leave it at that. And Erin, I guess you're gonna um, turn it over to question and answer. Yes, certainly. Thank you so much, Dr. Sims. Mm -hmm. uh, this is incredible work, and it's it's an honor and privilege having you here today. Um, we do have one question so far from Norma, uh, which is, which Pueblos uh, besides Acoma are uh, developing a written system? So Zuni Pueblo has has had has had a written language for some time. Um, the Tewa um, language community of San Juan and uh, especially back in the 70s developed a writing system for, for Tewa, for their dialect of Tewa. Uh, there was some work done in Santa Clara. Um, there's some work that has been done at Laguna, uh, some that started in that time, but then it kind of came and went. Um, so there are a number of Pueblos that had have had some um, work being done in writing language. Santa Ana is another Pueblo as well. Uh, anyone else, please feel free to speak up. Let's see, we have another one. Uh, hi, Christine, great presentation. Are we doing any online language classes at ACOMA? So um, the tribe, as I understand, um, uh, through its education department, um, does have some online classes. Uh, those are only open to uh, members of the ACOMA community. Uh, and a lot of that has been driven because of COVID. Um, normally these things probably would have been done in person and they were being done in person in the community. But because of the restrictions on you know, social distancing and all of that, um, they've had to uh, use this technology to be able to maintain that. So as I understand it, there's um, two, uh, two classes that are going on right now. We have one from Deborah. Uh, what was the process to include elders, traditional leaders to overcome the process of written language? So it varies probably in different communities because of course the, the, the leadership uh, oftentimes in our pueblos uh, uh, very much are concerned about how uh, publicly these languages are, are are utilized and because of the particular perspectives that Pueblo people, I believe, hold um, 
uh, with regard to the privacy of not only their culture, but also their languages. Um, this has been an issue that um, different tribes, different Pueblos have, have gone about um, addressing in different ways. And I can only speak about my experience as, as part of um, the history of, of what I uh, was involved with as, as the bilingual director back in the 1980s. And during that time, uh, it, in order to develop that writing system, in order to develop those materials, uh, we did have to get the, the blessing of our tribal leadership, you know, uh, to make sure and to assure them that this was not for purposes of, you know, publishing out in, you know, outside uh, world, but that we were primarily doing it for the sake of the children and that we knew as members of the community what those parameters were in terms of what we could produce, you know, and so um, those kinds of conversations, uh, you know, had to take place at that time uh, so that we, we could, uh, we, so that we could move forward with the work that we, we felt we needed to do. Other Pueblos, I'm not privy to how they've addressed these, you know, continue, you know, these conversations as well. But I know in San Juan Pueblo, for example, in the 1970s and also at Zuni Pueblo about the same time, these kinds of conversations probably were going on as well within, within their communities. Thank you. Uh... We have one from Veronica. Uh, who is eligible yeah. for your summer classes and where can we find information? Uh, about that? Okay. Um, the Summer Institute, if that's what you're um, asking about, Veronica, is uh, again primarily for native language teachers. Um, they're our first priority in terms of people who are involved in language teaching or who are pre preparing to do that, either in a community based program or either in a school-based program. Um, that's kind of one of the parameters we have for, for the Institute. The Institute um, this summer, um, the flyer is being made ready as we speak and it should go out shortly. But I can tell you right offhand, um, it will be virtually for two weeks um, starting June, um, excuse me. starting June 7th to the 18th. And um, there is no fee for the Institute, but we do offer if people do uh, want, uh, if language teachers do need the uh, course credit, I do offer it as um, for undergraduate credit three hours and, or graduate credit for three hours. So that's an option. And for that, obviously, there's um, there's a fee for that, the regular UNM tuition fee. But otherwise, if you're just attending, then then you um, you don't have to pay anything. Uh, we're all we're asking this time around because it's virtually is that you have good connections like you know what we have here today because all of the sessions will be done virtually by Zoom. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, let's see, we have one from Marianne. Uh, hi, Christine. Wonderful presentation. How difficult has it been in recruiting younger heritage language teachers? And secondly, how has this past year with distance education impacted heritage language classes? Yeah. Um, I would probably say that, again, it depends by community. And in, in a lot of the, the main factor there is whether you have um, fluent speaking younger adults who can, you know, step forward and help teach. Um, but in many cases, I've seen in, in a, a lot of communities where uh, you don't have adult speakers who are uh, fluent to the level of older speakers. But I always say, you got to start somewhere, right? So why not bring on younger adults who are willing to learn and who are willing to help teach, but maybe their fluency is not yet to the level of, of an older speaker, but they can be mentored, you know, and they can be brought along to learn and also be practice their language with, with children uh, as part of um, growing up 
uh, growing a new cohort, if you will, of new language teachers. Uh, but again, some communities, uh, to be honest with you, are, are really kind of at the brink where they don't have that many adult speakers left. And so those communities really have to, to work hard to figure out how are they going to continue to maintain these efforts, you know, for language teaching if they have not yet mentored younger ones. So that's definitely a challenge, definitely issue. And then um, Marianne, thank you for, for um, putting in the chat room. You ask about distant education. Yeah, that's been a big one. And uh, especially with COVID, it's really... Um, I think opened up a lot of uh, windows into seeing how one, we have a lot of work to do to make technology accessible to our rural communities and especially our Native American communities. Uh, we don't have broadband, you know, we don't have broadband in our homes. Uh, I, I'm, I'm beaming in, uh, you know, from Albuquerque because that's the only place where I can really get a good signal. Otherwise, some of us, you know, have to go down to I-40 to the McDonald's, you know, hamburger station in, in the in the parking lot, at least get some kind of Wi-Fi signal. And, and that's the reality, unfortunately, for many of our Native American communities. So this use of technology for language teaching has not been uh, even across the board. It, it depends on what people are able to do uh, at home, whether they have even the hardware Secondly, the access, sometimes those little jet packs that we often, in fact, I used to use that and, and, and that has kind of fallen, <laughs> fallen off the table, um, but I, I don't use that anymore. And in fact, then I just, you know, beam out from, from here in Albuquerque when I need to. And, and I've had to do that for my own classes at UNM because there was no in-person classes uh, allowed this past year. So, Technology, as, as great as, uh, you know, we sometimes uh, think it is, it's still not e equitably accessible, I guess I would say. And that, for sure, has impacted uh, a lot of the availability of virtual language classes in a lot of places. Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we have one from Dale. Oh, good. Is okay. there a research agenda for your center? Um, right now, uh, I am looking at um, a collaborative research project that's been funded as part of a, a fellowship grant from uh, the uh, RWJ Foundation. Uh, I'm collaborating with um, two colleagues from uh, Michigan State University. We're looking at how to do uh, better observation of children's, young children's uh, native language use in Head Start programs. Um, you know, for years and years, Head Start has utilized um, assessment uh, protocols that um, many of us have felt don't capture what it is children are actually able to do, especially, especially now that native language is begin, beginning to take on more focus. And so one of the things that uh, my colleagues and I are trying to do is um, pilot uh, some observational tools that perhaps would do a better job of capturing what is it that um, children, native children uh, are able to do in a native language? How does that, how does that link in or tie in with um, the foundations we say that are important for them to gain in terms of culture and language. Um, that's an area that uh, that is sorely needed, I guess I should say. Uh, and there's not been a lot of research uh, really on much of the language revitalization efforts taking place in early childhood education. And we feel that that's a necessary part of our our um, building our knowledge base and our research as well. So, um, so that's one example of, of the kinds of things that we that I'm doing right now uh, through our center. Uh, Barbara Meek, uh, I'm working with Jessica um, uh, Nahor, uh, Barnes Nahor, and also Anne Cameron. Uh, we are part of a fellowship grant uh, from the R, uh, RWJ Foundation. <laughs> 
I'm going to put in my email in the chat room. Uh, there's some questions, some more questions about this summer's um, institute. Uh, and um, if you want more information, you can just email me, tell me, uh, tell me uh, what you would like to know, and I will try to try to answer you. Uh, let's see. Let me do this. Uh, actually, Erin, um, could you put this in the chat room, my address, because I'm, I'm not able to. Of course. Get, uh, yeah, it's just csims, csims at unm.edu. In sims, this was one M. Uh, I would be happy to do that. Uh, we have Thank one you. more question um, from Terry. Uh, what is the best approach for a grandparent to teach young children who do not attend schools where the language is taught? Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's such a thing as as I think a lot of. Um, interest in in home programs, meaning um, what can you do at home, uh, you know, to support language and I know uh, in um, some instances where families have decided to come together, you know, and they make an effort uh, uh, to meet on weekends. In the past, I've, I've uh, known some families who've done that. Um, a good friend of mine uh, was telling me how her and her sisters had decided uh, to meet, come together on on Saturdays, and they bring their children with them, and they decide to you know share a good meal, but all during the time that they're together, the sisters because they do speak the language, um, use it so that they and use it with the children, and and so that they have that kind of mini inver immersion environment at least you know for for a for a day or an afternoon, but they do it. They tried to do it you know. Um, uh, consistently, so that their own children and grandchildren would begin, you know, to to pick up some of that, you know, that's an example of um, bringing together support. Of course, now with the distance, social distancing thing, I don't know how um, how feasible that would be, but there are many common things you can do at home. I mean, uh, I was um, making tamales the other. Uh, let's say this was before Christmas uh, with my um, granddaughter and you know we were talking about making tamales in you know in in Ankoma. Uh, I mean things that you would normally do with your grandchild you know use those as times to talk about and talk to them in the language point out things to them you know this is called a corn husk this is you know masa this is you know in the directions now you you know, smooth the dough on the corn husk, you fold the corn husk, you know, tie it up. Um, those are just simple ways that you can uh, do that with your own grandchildren in your home. Um, but it also is good to be able to come together and perhaps when COVID passes, those in-person gatherings become more important for us because one, we've been, we've been isolated so much now for, you know, for a good year. And I think coming together is going to be a welcome time, but maybe those are the times that you remember. Let's, you know, let's speak to the children. Let's use that language when the children are around us, um, because that messaging is important for children in terms of that language, that target language being important to their families and also in their communities. Mm. Um, and I, I just had a question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know what hmm. tribes and languages you might have interacted with in Northern California. So um, when I was doing my doctoral work at UC Berkeley, uh, my main, um, the, the communities that I was able to uh, actually spend some time with were the Karuk people uh, who live uh, up in the, above, um, in the Shasta mountain area. Uh, they live next to uh, the Hoopas, which is another tribe in the Yurok uh, people. But in particular, the Karuk people were um, really gracious. And I, I met some families that actually I invited to come to New Mexico in, in 1995. 
uh, asking them to come and share their experiences with some of our Pueblo people who were interested in what this language immersion approach was, because we had never utilized that or heard about it. And so um, these folks in California were a couple, a young couple that were learning their Karuk language as adults. What caught my interest was the fact that they were learning their language from a, a, a aunt, uh, aunt of theirs who was totally blind, uh, but she was one of the last of the fluent adult speakers of Karuk, um, and she lived by herself uh, in, in a community that was about 100 miles away from where this young couple lived. And every weekend, this young couple with their children in tow, I think they had like three little kids um, below the age of 10 at the time, um, they would drive 100 miles through this winding mountain roads to meet with um, Auntie Violet. And they had come to an agreement with Auntie Violet that they would come and help her get chores done that she needed help with because she was blind, legally blind. Um, but the time that they spent together, they asked Auntie Violet if she would talk to them just in Karuk. And that's how they began to pick up the language. So they take Auntie Violet to go shopping for her groceries, but they would do all of that in the language. They would take her to do her laundry and they would do all of that in the language. So it was it was really kind of a neat way. And that's, that's again, something that I, I learned from, from spending time with that family uh, as part of my, my doctoral uh, research and work at UC Berkeley. That is pretty remarkable. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always thought it was, yeah, yeah. And the children were picking it up along the way. And um, the the man young man's name was Terry, Terry Sapahan. He's still in, in, in Karuk country, but he used to say, you know, as soon as we, we master something in the Karuk language, we make sure that we turn around and teach that to our children. And then they were also starting up a some immersion classes at their local school uh, in, in Orleans is where they live. And those are the things that they taught in their classes. So Terry was always the uh, one who said, you know, I learned to say this better by actually using it and then teaching it to somebody else. Um, and that was his kind of um, one of the things that he strategies that he used for learning his own language. Several years ago, uh, yeah, about six, seven years ago, I took a language class with the Shasta. Um, I have oh. some heritage in the, in the Shasta. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. But it's hard to keep that up. Um, it is. Uh, and especially when there's distance involved, you know, and um, like I said, at the time when I was doing this in the 1990s, uh, it, it was a long distance. I mean, I remember, f you know, flying into, I think it's Humboldt, and then I you know, on this little, t little plane, you know, and um, then I had to get a car, and then I would drive these winding roads to get to Orleans, you know, which is where the, 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 the couple lived. Uh, and I thought, wow, the distance people have to travel just to be able to come together with just what they did. But they had such a commitment to learning that language that they were willing to do this, you know, almost every weekend of their lives, you know, in, in, in a way, this kind of work is something that does take a long time. A lot of grant funders that I have had to deal with in, in the past have often thought, oh, you know, is three years enough time to really help support this kind of effort? And I always say, no, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sims. This has been You're welcome. Uh, a very uh, incredible afternoon. So you are definitely welcome to come to Casa San Isidro anytime. We are would... open uh, Tuesday through Saturday, and um, you can register for a tour on Hold My Ticket. Nice. Okay. I will definitely take you up on that. And I want to thank everybody for your attention, and thank you for, uh, I see Bridget. Thank you, Bridget. A lot of people that I know, Prudy, <laughs> they're from Acoma. <laughs> Bridget says, go Bears, because she used to be at Berkeley, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank All you, right. everyone. Have a good afternoon.
Bye-bye.